You are listening to the Super Mom is Getting Tired podcast. I'm your host, Tori Henderson, and this is episode 137. All links and show notes can be found by going to lifecoachingforparents.com slash 137. Welcome to the Super Mom is Getting Tired podcast. This show is designed for moms who invest everything into parenting, but get overwhelmed, lost, and resentful. Listen and learn how to unburden yourself, feel calm, full of energy, and in control. I'm your host, Master Certified Life Coach, Teacher, and Recovering Supermom, Tori Henderson. Hello, Supermoms. How are you? I am amazing. I'm so good. It's so good to connect with you. I hope that you had a great Halloween. Can you believe it's November already? Clocks are changing this weekend. I'm wondering how that's going for you. Let's see, this is fall back. So this is when we get an extra hour of sleep, right? This is when it benefits us. <laughs> so I hope you're doing great as well. I am excited because I got my time for the talk class starting tonight. We're going to do a class with just moms and 12 to 13 year old girls. So that should be fun. If you're listening to this on November 1st, you haven't missed the deadline yet. But if you're listening to it on November 2nd, then you did. But you can still catch up with us in January. We're going to be doing a class for 10 to 12-year-old boys and girls, co-ed, all genders class. So if you are interested, just shoot me an email, tori at lifecoachingforparents.com. Tell me you want to be on the interest list for January sex education class for your preteen and I will uh, let you know when we got the date and time picked out. In fact, those who are first on my list get to help me choose the date and time with the one that works best with their schedule. So it's an advantage to get in ahead of the game. You can go to timeforthetalk.com to learn more. But that's not what we're going to talk about here today. That was last podcast. Today, we are going to talk about living with constant criticism coming from teenagers. Now, it's kind of ironic. I got two similar questions today, both about critical teenagers, both from moms who are living with constant criticism coming at them from their adolescence, but on different topics. So I will read Julie's first and then Genevieve's, and you can see how similar they really are. Julie writes, I understand it's normal for teenagers to think they know everything and that their parents are old-fashioned and out of touch with reality. But living with constant criticism is something I didn't sign up for. No matter what I do, my teenager has something negative to say about it. If I use the wrong pronoun for his friend, I am lectured about he is a they. I get scolded if I make hamburgers for dinner because cows are the second biggest producers of carbon emissions. It's not like I'm condemning his values. I'm doing my best to be open-minded and stay up to speed with social changes. But I can't buy a new pair of jeans without being reminded about the devastating effects fast fashion is having on the planet. Do you have any suggestions for surviving the next few years with a woke kid who makes me feel like everything I do is wrong? I have tried to explain that criticizing is not the way to affect change, but it seems to fall on deaf ears. Julie. All right. I got you, girl. (laughs) So first, I just want you to listen to the tone of her question. She's obviously fed up. She's annoyed. Nobody likes being criticized all the time. She's like, this is not something I signed up for. So what I love about this is that she probably... I feel like she has a sense that this is not the energy with which to talk to her teenager and try to change his behavior. And so instead she wrote to me. So this is the perfect thing to do. If you find yourself feeling fed up, feeling annoyed and frustrated, writing it down, whether that's an email to me or in your journal, is so helpful. I have a self-coaching guide that I give to my clients to use when in between coaching calls, they're feeling really upset or they're really annoyed and they know they shouldn't talk to their kids from this energetic state, they can fill out this self-coaching guide and it shifts them from I call lower brain to higher brain. It kind of walks you through some calming down. So I just, I love that she thought, I'm going to write it this time. And um, you you don't, you shouldn't have to live with 
constant criticism. Like that's not very fun. And you don't have to just be annoyed and frustrated for the many, many years of adolescence. Nine to 19 people, that's a decade of your life. You live with an adolescent more than you live with a child who's not an adolescent, especially if they have an extra year at home or junior college or something like that. Or then they move back. (laughs) But I guess they're not as adolescents then. Okay, so thank you, Julie, for that wonderful question. We are going to answer it. But before I do, I want to read Genevieve's question because it's quite similar. She says, Dear Tori, my daughter is a delightful human as far as teenagers go, but she is constantly scrutinizing and criticizing my appearance. She complains about my clothing choices, my lack of makeup, and my wrinkles. She wants me to style my long hair with a part down the middle like hers and carry a fanny pack diagonally across my body like she does. Part of me thinks it's sweet that she wants me to be on trend and look like she looks. But the other part of me gets annoyed with the constant criticism of my appearance. Why can't she just appreciate and accept me as I am? Genevieve. Okay, well, let's start with the parent educator answer, which is what do I do when my teenager is constantly criticizing me? So Julie can offer her son alternative comments. It's just like when they were little and they would, I don't know, grab a toy out of your hand and you'd say, uh, uh, try that again. We say, please. What do you say? Please. Thank you, mommy. And you just kind of hold them accountable and repeat, repeat, repeat so that they learn some manners. So Julie can do that with her son by offering alternatives to, instead of criticizing her and lecturing her and making her feel bad about herself. He could say things like, may I offer you a greener alternative to buying your jeans at Old Navy? Or he could say, my friend Jordan identifies as they, them. Just a polite reminder rather than a lecture. Um, How about this one? Would you like to go thrifting with me this weekend? That is a polite way to remind mom that thrift stores are valid places to go shopping. Or mom, would you be willing to extend meatless Mondays to three days per week if I cook? So teaching your child how to get the same result, but actually, honestly, would be give him a better result <laughs> by asking politely and giving him kind of polite questions to ask or invitations is probably going to yield him a more willing participant. Mom's probably going to be more likely to want to make these greener choices or be more, uh, how do you say, like top of mind when it comes to using the proper pronouns if it's handled in a polite way, right? Nobody likes to be scolded. So I suggest mom can write these prompts on cards so that and give them to her son that so that he has them handy, put them on the refrigerator, keep them nearby so that every time he starts criticizing her, she can point to the fridge, she can hand him the card and just kind of come up with some ideas of how to word things in a polite way when she's feeling calm so that when she starts to feel criticized, she can just point to the card. Because right now his way of influencing his mom is making her defensive and it's going to make other people defensive too. So when he learns how to voice his values through polite questions and corrections, he has a better likelihood of impacting the social changes that he wants to see in the world. So it sounds like Julie's son is focused on all that mom is doing imperfectly. So what if you taught him to focus on the positive changes that he sees you making? He could say like, hey, mom, thanks for composting again. I know it's a burden, but I notice you're making an effort. Or mom, I appreciate you for trying to use the right, proper pronouns. I know it's hard to remember. So he could compliment you on the progress that you're making. He could also brag about the things that he's doing that he's proud of. Rather than focusing on all of mom's flaws and inadequacies, Ask him, interrupt him when he's pointing out and criticizing you. Say, well, tell me about a positive thing that you did today. Tell me about the vegan burger you chose at lunch so that he can kind of brag about himself 
and remind himself that he is doing positive things for the planet. And then you can tell him how much it inspires you when he does eat vegan or when he shops at Goodwill and how like it's really great to learn by example and point out all the ways that his positive role modeling impacts others. Soon he will see that the best way to influence people is to be happy about the positive choices you are making. For Genevieve's daughter, she could offer alternatives like, would you like me to try out some new makeup on you, mom? Or I think your hair looks cute with the middle part, right? Worded as a compliment. How about you put these boots on without outfit? Do you want to look cool by wearing this backpack instead of your old purse? She can offer it in a fun, playful, positive way rather than kind of that negative critical mindset. When my kids were little, I couldn't stand to see them with smudges on their faces. It was like this impulse came over me to wipe the food off their chin or the boogers or gunk or whatever was all over their face and then restore them to their beautiful, clean selves. I really, I tried hard not to be the mom that licked her finger and then wiped off the smudge, but I'm sure I did a couple times at least. But I realized how much I enjoyed seeing my kids look beautifully put together. If their hair was wonky, it was a distraction to me. I would reach out to smooth it down. I found it hard to concentrate on what they were saying because I was focused on what I wanted to fix. I did not like this about me. I want to be the kind of mother who accepts their kid and just can look at them every second of every day and just like, I love your spirit. You're so beautiful. You're perfect in every way. But the little critical part of my brain is very active. And so I had to work to override that part of my brain, you know, rather than trying to tweak their appearance or fix this or clean them up, whatever it was, I had to try hard not to be in that critical brain. But I also started putting more effort into my appearance when I went to visit my parents, just in case they felt the same way. Like maybe they feel the same. Like they don't like to see their daughter in sweatpants and, you know, tangled hair. So I started trying to like look my best when I go visit my parents because I don't know, maybe they feel similarly. But if your daughter is stuck in critically analyzing your appearance, ask her to give two compliments for every modification. So if she's going to tell you that she wants you to change your hair, then say, what's one thing you do like about my appearance right now that you don't want me to change? Just because it helps shift her out of that critical mindset, which is just not a very fun place to dwell. You could also ask her to focus on what's great about your personality, your ideas, your actions, like get her brain unstuck from what you look like. And then ask her to talk about what her favorite outfit is. So like if she's telling you, mom, I don't like that shirt you're wearing or mom, do do you mind changing? Let's wear this instead. And she's kind of critically analyzing your outfit. You could say, show me your favorite outfit or what do you love about what you're wearing today? What's your favorite uh, hairstyle that you're enjoying right now? Because fear and love exist in two different parts of the brain. When you are in the critical part of your brain, that's the fearful part of your brain. You're afraid that what these kids are afraid of, I'm not sure. I mean, obviously, Julie said could be afraid that the world's going to hell in a handbasket and that we're all headed for mass extinction. And it's up to him to save the planet. That's a very likely fear. For Genevieve's daughter, maybe she's afraid of being embarrassed I don't know, her mom being kind of out of touch or people making fun of her. I'm not really sure. But I do know that fear and love cannot coexist at the same time. So if you can get your kids to shift out of fear and into love, then you, they can think about what do they love to wear? What do they love to um What do they love about mom? What do they love about the changes you're making and the choices you're making? Gratitude is the fastest bridge to move from fear to love. So today's life coaching answer, what gets in our way from being able to teach our kids 
alternative means of communication and being, you know, how to ask things in a polite way or how to word things nicely. What, what gets in our way for that is being constantly criticized. When someone is constantly criticizing others for not being or doing enough, it is annoying. Most people either have that voice in their head like, I'm not good enough or I'm too much. Either I'm too much or I'm not enough. Tell me where I'm wrong, people. (laughs) Send me an email and tell me if you've got neither of those voices in your head. But most of the mamas that I talk to either have I'm too much or I'm not enough right? So when someone's constantly criticizing you, it triggers that voice in their head that says, I'm not good enough. I'm not doing enough. And when your kid is criticizing you for not being enough, it's a sign that they now have that voice in their head. When we criticize, we're in that fearful part of our brain, right? It's coming from fear, So I'm going to guess that Julie's son is worried that he isn't doing enough for the planet and he wants his mom to do better so that he can feel less worried. My hunch is that Genevieve's daughter is worried about her own appearance, sees her mom as a reflection of her, and therefore wants to fix her mom so she can feel safe and relaxed. It's the same thing parents do to their kids, right? We want our teens to do well in school so we don't have to worry about their future. We want to feel like successful parents and we sometimes equate grades to that success. We ask our kids to be kind-hearted and respectful of others so we can feel like we've done a good job raising them. We try to change our external world so that we can feel better on the inside. We see our kids as a reflection of us, and it sounds like these teens see a mom as a reflection of them. But before we redirect their behavior, we got to connect with the kids. Because we want to love our kids. We want to enjoy being around them. But it's hard when they criticize our every move. Our brains are naturally mirroring the emotions of the people around us. So when we see somebody sad, we feel sad. When we see someone is relaxed and at peace, it's easier for us to drop into a peaceful state. When your child is critical, it is super easy to feel inadequate and then criticize back for making you feel inadequate. (laughs) So a natural response is to criticize them for criticizing you. But it doesn't help us feel loving towards our kids And I believe the first step in living with constant criticism from your teenagers is to find compassion, love, gratitude. We've got to shift that brain before we can tell them, here's the suggestion that I would offer you. Here's an alternative, because otherwise it's just going to come out with like criticizing them, right? So we've got to find that and kind of reconnect that feeling of love to our kids even when they're criticizing. So I'm going to give it a shot. It sounds like Julie's son is struggling with the daunting task of saving the planet. He probably has high empathy and high awareness. He knows what changes need to happen in a very short period of time in order to prevent the mass extinction of the human race and many other species. But he also understands how limited his power is. This is scary and a powerless situation to be in. So he's trying to have impact on the one area where he feels safe to express himself. That is home with mom. So perhaps criticizing mom is helping him build the strength and the courage that he needs to spread his important message to others. And when he criticizes his mom and still is loved by her, then it gives him confidence to speak values to others, hoping that he'll also be accepted and loved by others. So we just want to think about Julie's son as putting ourselves in his shoes and kind of figuring out like, where is the fear? What's the worry? Because when somebody is scared, it's a lot easier for us to be compassionate towards them, to appreciate what they're trying to do, even if it that you don't like the way in which he's doing it, you can appreciate the intention, right? And be grateful that he cares so deeply and is trying 
hard to help solve the problem. It could be that Genevieve's daughter has picked up on the cultural messaging that how one looks really matters and is scared that she isn't up to snuff. Our youth and beauty obsessed culture is a hard one to ignore and granted has done a lot of damage. So she's probably scared and feeling inadequate, feeling like she's not quite good enough and she wants herself to look as beautiful as possible and having her mom look as beautiful as possible is one way in which she wants to help solve that dilemma. Now, it's also possible that your daughter's passion and purpose in, is to beautify and prettify our world. So some people have an eye for color, design, style, form that's really valuable. So you can show your daughter that happiness and beauty do not go together. That there's nothing wrong with wanting people and things to be beautiful, but it's separate from happiness. When she sees you happy and comfortable in your skin, no matter what you look like that day, you are helping her see that one can exist without the other. Redirect your daughter's desires to prettify by asking her to help with some home design or holiday decorating, or maybe some, you know, baking a cake or putting food on a plate, like help me make it look pretty. If that's what she is focused on and loves to do, is she wants to beautify things, then there's lots of other ways you can do that. And also you can remind your daughter, Genevieve, that there are people out there who want her fashion and beauty advice and even people who are willing to pay for it. So mom might not be the one who wants that, but maybe she could reach out to her auntie or her cousin or her neighbor and say, hey, would you like a makeover? So even though you aren't enjoying the way the message is being communicated from your teens, you can be grateful that your teens are open-hearted and wanting their moms to learn about what's important to them and the next generation, right? These teens don't want you, they don't want to leave you in the dust like an out-of-touch Karen. They want you to come along for the ride and recognizing that even though the criticism is uh, annoying, your teens are saying, mom, come with me. You are important to me. Like, I want you to know the things I know and learn about the things I'm learning. And I want you to help change things for the better. So that was just my way of trying to find ways to think about the teens' criticism that help increase compassion, gratitude, appreciation, and love. Because when you're in that state, then you are have a better success of teaching your kids how to get their point across, live their values, and influence others in positive ways. Today's super bomb kryptonite is being told what to do. Nobody likes being told what to do. It's an ineffective way to get someone to change behavior. And yet, we do it all the time. Eat your vegetables, clean your room, put away the iPad, take out the garbage. One of our main jobs as parents is to get our kids to do stuff they don't want to do. So how the heck (laughs) are you supposed to tell kids what to do without telling them what to do? Because we know nobody likes it. Like your teenagers, for Genevieve and Julie, their teenagers are telling them what to do and it makes them want to do the opposite. It triggers the inner rebel. And when we tell our teenagers, what we want them to do, it triggers their inner rebel, makes them not want to do it. So I want to tell you about this study that social researchers were doing because they were trying to figure out how to get kids to do what we want to do. And they started with trying to get kids, picky eaters in particular, to try new vegetables. How do you get kids to eat vegetables they haven't seen before when they are resistant to change. So they tried all these different methods and you've probably heard some of the results. They found that exposing kids to the new food 15 times, having them help prepare what's being served, all that, like that it just kind of that exposure, it's exposure therapy. (laughs) It's like if you're afraid of 
elevators, then you read a book about elevators and you talk about elevators and you learn about them. So I guess we're doing that with vegetables when we help kids kind of cook with us. But you might not have heard that the number one most successful way to get picky kids, picky eaters, this is like older than five years old, to try new foods is to sit them next to a teenager of the same gender who is happily eating this new food while also ignoring the kid. Okay, so they did this experiment with broccoli. They wanted the kids to try broccoli. So they sat him down at this cafeteria table and they had the kid sitting there with his meal, like no broccoli inside. I think it was all like white and brown food. (laughs) And then this teenager sat down next to them happily devoured this bowl of broccoli while the kid was sitting across from him watching. That teenager never once offered him any broccoli, never talked about broccoli. Mmm, this is really delicious. You should try this. Didn't say a word to the child, but that child suddenly felt an innate desire to try broccoli for the first time. Watching people happily enjoying something that you haven't seen before is a powerful way to motivate to try something new. Other people trying something new. So if Julie's son wants her to try something new, he wants her to try vegan food or composting or shopping at thrift stores, whatever, then the most powerful way for him to influence his mom is to demonstrate doing that while being happy, finding great finds at the thrift store, talking about how much, how cheap it was, you know, how little money he spent, showing mom how happy he is, how delicious the food is, like watching him cook vegan, eat vegan, enjoy vegan. If you want your teen to positively express their values in a way that isn't annoying, (laughs) then you could model that for them, right? So your teens can model it like uh, Genevieve's daughter can enjoy getting dressed up, enjoy like looking in the mirror and, oh, mom, look at my new outfit. Like, look at my hair. Look how cute it is. Do you want me to do yours too? It's that joy and enthusiasm and exuberance that influences others without even having to say a word. Today's Supermom Power Boost is a trophy recycling service. So you may know by now that I have picked up this new hobby called decluttering. (laughs) And I've got 21 years of stuff. I've lived in the same house. I've got 21 years of stuff sitting around my house and collecting dust. And the kids have decided they do not need to hold on to their trophies anymore. So, but I'm trying not to just dump things in the landfill, right? And with a lot of things, it's hard to find places to recycle, reuse, you know, to make good use of the things I'm trying to get rid of. But I have found a trophy recycling service. So I was... So excited. It's in Wisconsin, but it's called Total Awards and Promotions. And what they do is they repurpose your old trophies and donate rebuilt trophies to nonprofits. So you can, you print out a ticket, you can put up tickets up to 25 trophies in one box, ship it to them, and then they will reuse them for nonprofits. So if you're a nonprofit, you can apply to have trophies for free made for whatever you want to you know, people you want to give them out to. So I was just so excited because, you know, material goods are so cheap. They're so easy to access. Buying things is easy, but getting rid of things is hard. And I found very few people that are interested in taking on my clutter. So uh, I thought this was a great win-win. So it's, it's benefiting nonprofits as well as people trying to declutter and not, you know, just pollute the planet. So if you know other places that reuse and repurpose, please let me know. Go on to the Super Moms Getting Tired Facebook group. Tell me where. Next up is my wedding gown I'm trying to get rid of. If you know anyone, I could get a place I can recycle that or 
repurpose it. I've got some track cleats and snow boots and all sorts of things. So please help me out with my decluttering project because uh, it's a lot easier to buy than it is to um, dispose of things in, in responsible fashion. Today's quote of the day. The chief symptom of adolescence is a state of expectation a tendency towards creative work, and a need for the strengthening of self-confidence. Suddenly, the child becomes very sensitive to the rudeness and humiliations which he had previously suffered with patient indifference. That is a quote from Maria Montessori. So I just thought it was an interesting way to word it, where it's Adolescence is a time for the need of the strengthening of self-confidence. I think that's what the kids are trying to do by looking as good as you can and trying to get mom to look as good as she can, trying to get mom to be a sensitive, woke, environmentally responsible person is they're trying to strengthen their self-confidence where maybe the the rudeness of polluting the planet and the humiliation of having a mom who's not on trend <laughs> they could have suffered before in their childhood now that adolescence is here the emotions are a lot more intense and they can no longer suffer those in things in silence so just a different take on this wonderful frustrating emotional intense highly critical stage of life Good luck to you, super moms living with teenagers. I will love you and leave you. Want a free life coaching session? Go to lifecoachingforparents.com and schedule yours today. And thank you so much for listening. I would love it if you would subscribe and share these podcasts with your friends. If you have a question you'd like me to answer on the air, go to lifecoachingforparents.com slash record my question and you can send me a voicemail recording or write me an email and I'll answer it on the air. Thanks again. Have a great day.